Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to another fantastic, phenomenal, amazing, mysterious, revolutionary installment of SBS Breakdown. Bam, 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 bam. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, I'm sorry. Actually, I lied. Uh, it's really not that revolutionary. We don't really talk about any of the revolutionaries in this video. Uh, oh, wait, no, no, no. I take that back. We actually have an, a question about Ivankov. So Ivankov is mentioned here. Oh, and Kuma as well. Okay, yeah, so Ivankov and Kuma. This is a revolutionary SBS breakdown. We'll be tackling uh, volume 108 today. Uh, here's the cover. Looks pretty sleek, I have to say. The volume covers have been really on. On fire last couple of installments uh, we have Kizaru back there wearing his like alternate admiral coat you know I just realized Kizaru has an admiral outfit that's like yellow and white that we saw at Sabaody and then we have one here that's yellow and black we see him wearing this in film red now I don't know if this is just a miscommunication with the anime team or something maybe it was always supposed to look like this but considering Kizaru represents unclear justice and sometimes might be you know you just don't know what he's going to do having those two alternate color schemes actually works for him, right? Uh, but you also have Bonnie there. You got Luffy having fun in Gear 5th. You got Sentomaru. He finally made a volume cover. I, I don't think Sentomaru ever had a volume cover before, but he does now, so that's pretty sweet. Alright, before we get into the breakdown, though, I do want to mention this, because I am filming this on February 29th also known as Leap Day, also known as The Phantom Day. Ooh, does it exist? It only comes around every four yards this day. So I just wanted to say happy birthday to anybody that just happened to have been born on February 29th. I don't know how many people in my audience, if anybody, probably statistically a few people, but it does kind of suck that your actual birthday, I mean, you could celebrate your birthday whenever, February 28th, you know, March 1st, you know, whenever the most convenient, but it does kind of suck that your actual birthday only exists every four years. So, happy birthday to everybody. There you go. All, all the Leap Day uh, children. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to leave a link down below to the uh, mega thread over on the One Piece Reddit if you would like to follow along. I'm not going to cover every single question in the SBS, but just the ones that I've deemed the most uh, pertinent to the story. I, I cover the bulk of them, uh, but there's a few more that are just like about random background characters or whatever. Uh, this information is provided by, we have Pew Peace, Inumaru08, The Will of Marco, and of course... Artor over at the Library of O'Hara, uh, the maker of the fabulous uh, One Piece globe plushie, right? So, let's get right into this. A very important question regarding... Morgans. Big news, Morgans. There was a question a while ago regarding Morgans, and I believe that's where Oda revealed that he had the bird, bird, fruit model albatross, but somebody mentioned, like, is Morgans a mink? You know, I think maybe more of a confusion, because Oda clarifies it even more here that he has that fruit, and that he just always stays in his bird form, okay? He also goes on to say that the minks are kind of like fluffy animals with, like, like fur, okay? I don't think we've ever seen a mink that's not a mammal, uh, because on Zoe, they have, like, their crocodile, like, steeds, and so they're clearly in, like, a different class, a different category. In fact, minks even said that humans are essentially lesser minks to them, because they're still mammals, they still have fur. I guess it's the amount of fur that determines whether you're a mink or not. So we have, um, we have a dog, we have rabbits, we have cats, we have gorillas, so, like, apes, uh, we have pandas. Does. We have squirrels, because uh, Tristan was a mink uh, squirrel, uh, Miyagi was a goat, so I, I believe they're all mammals, and uh, a bird would not be a mammal, so yeah, I guess maybe there was some confusion there, but yeah, so um, Morgans has the power of the albatross, he just always stays in his bird form, and Oda also clarifies, like he kind of brings up, like, hmm, I wonder what he looks like without him being in his bird form, and you know what I was thinking? This is actually very smart on Morgans' part. In fact, more people that have zone powers could do this, they just don't. So when you eat a zone, you get the three transformations, right? You have your base form, so if you're a human, that's just what you normally look like. And then you have your hybrid, and then you have your full animal form, okay? Well, considering Morgan's profession, where he is a journalist, okay? He's always out there to get a scoop on everything, right? It's actually really smart to stay in his full bird form most of the time. And then if he ever 
wants to go undercover. If he ever feels like getting the story firsthand, like not trusting it to his like workers, his employees or whatever, he wants to get out there and get that scoop personally just transform into his regular human form because nobody probably recognizes him because he's been in his bird form for most of his life. So it's like, I'm going to transform. I think he's in his 50s. So he would transform into this, like, you know, middle-aged kind of guy with, like, graying hair. Um, and he would probably wear, like, glasses and maybe smoke a big cigar or whatever and just like, I'm big news, Morgans! You know, and he just goes out there and nobody would recognize him, okay? And then he goes back and prints the story. That would actually be really clever for him to do that, Okay. But just a clarifying question with that. Uh, next one is probably the big one. Uh, this is in regards to Mihawk's backstory. Yeah, I know, right? Mihawk's backstory. Now, Oda does not touch upon anything specific here. And I, I also saw some people saying that, like, oh, man, does this mean if we're finding out about Mihawk's backstory here that we're just not going to find out about it in the main story? I don't think that's the case at all. Uh, now, obviously, Oda has come out before and said, like, ah, I don't have time to fit this in the story. Like, the whole backstory with Sabo and Koala and Hack, he explains all that in an SBS. There's some other instances where he clarifies more things of backstory. Like, here, I remember, like, Raizo. The reason why Raizo and, and Fuku Rokuju hate each other has something to do with uh, Fuku Rokuju's sister and who had a thing for Rizo, so that was like a whole backstory thing we found in the SBS. I don't think that's the same thing here. In fact, Oda specifically, he tells us stuff without telling us stuff. It leaves more mystery open. So, um, Mihawk's past, at some point, uh, he suffered a betrayal of some kind. And, um, it involved the Marines, because at the beginning, remember, he was Marine Hunter Mihawk, just like how Zoro started as the Pirate Hunter, Mihawk used to be the Marine Hunter, and so he was hunting the Marines for many years, and eventually rises through the ranks of swordsmen, becomes the greatest swordsman in the world, and all that jazz. It actually doesn't even reference Shanks in the backstory, it just says he suffers a betrayal. Was the betrayal related to Shanks in some way? Did, did Mihawk, like, feel like he found a true rival in Shanks? And then Shanks lost the arm, so Mihawk was just, like, felt betrayed. Like, you've given up all of your strength, now we can't have a fight anymore because you lost an arm. Was it involving Shanks, or was it something else before Shanks and him even had the rivalry? It isn't really referenced here. However, it does mention, because when Crocodile reached out to Mihawk, remember, he was kind of like, hey, we have things in common, you know, we have a common distrust for others, is the way that Crocodile was kind of, like, uh, requesting Mihawk. Mihawk to join him in his operations, right? So the idea is they've both been betrayed at some point in the past. They've been burned before. And there's also this, like, underlying sense of, of loneliness and solitude with Mihawk and Crocodile. To the point where Oda even kind of says, like, they are people that are already getting tired of life. So Mihawk and Crocodile, they're only in, like, their mid-40s. I think Crocodile's 46, Mihawk's 44. And already they're kind of getting to the point where it's just like, what, 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 what are we even doing here? You know what I mean? Like, we're, we're like, we're like, kind of not really a midlife crisis, but kind of just like they've seen so much shit. They've been through so much shit in their lives that they're already just kind of done, you know, and that's kind of the, the general vibe with both of them. And you can kind of feel that with Mihawk. Mihawk spent most of his days in that castle by himself until Perona finally showed up. And so that actually adds a whole new dimension of Mihawk and Perona's, like, dynamic, where it's like he's always alone and now Perona's there and they're kind of like roommates and she's, like, helping him open up a little bit, you know? So it's like, that's kind of nice. I kind of like that. Um, now, eventually, the, he suffered a betrayal, and he ended up hunting the Marines. And then, later down the line, he got, you know, recruited into the Warlords, or he accepted the invitation into the Warlords. And the reason he did that was probably because of the sense of peace and tranquility. Like, he just like, alright, I'm being chased around by the Marines my whole life, so now I have a chance to kind of settle down and not worry about that anymore. But even that doesn't really make him happy. Now he's just like, I'm the greatest swordsman in the world, the only person that could even rival me was Shanks. But he lost an arm, so I don't deem him a challenge anymore. And now the Marines aren't chasing after me anymore, which is good. But now I'm just kind of like, it's like lonely. It's the loneliest at the top of the mountain. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. And so probably when Zoro showed up and Perona was there after he came back from Marine Ford, he was probably just happy to have the company, even though he wasn't going to say it himself, you know? And then Zoro requests to be trained by him. And Mihawk was probably just like... 
I get to have human interaction for two years. Maybe he's thinking, like, I'll train Zoro to get stronger, and then maybe I could have a, a worthy opponent. He could see that in Zoro. Like, Zoro's, maybe, he has the potential. Maybe he could do it. So, sure. I mean, like, just the idea that he had fun. And there's that cover page where him and Perona are, um, uh, are helping the human drills, like, till the fields on uh, Gloomy Island. And then when the Marines, when the Warlord system was abolished and the Marines started to surround the island, Mihawk seemed kind of excited. He was just like, ah, it's been a while since I've been chased. So th to put this in perspective, like the timeline of events here, because we don't know everything, anything specific, but he was betrayed at a young age. So he becomes the Marine Hunter out of that revenge. Maybe this is back when he was way more hot headed, way more. He was like a teenager, maybe. And maybe it might have been around the time Roger died. And he was just like, you know, I'm going to go hunt the Marines and cut them all down. Right. And so that goes on for years and years and years. He starts getting sick of that uh, because people are constantly hunting him. And then so then he joins the Warlord. So they stop doing that. And he's like, OK, finally, I got peace and quiet. But now I'm kind of alone, you know, Shanks isn't around anymore, and so then eventually the Warlord system gets abolished, and he's like, okay, back to this, but at least now it, it's something, okay, it's like, at least I'm not going to be alone anymore, I'll be chased after by the Marines, I guess. It's it's not great, but at least it's something. And then that's when Crocodile reaches out to him to join the Cross Guild with Buggy, I mean, the, the, the idea of joining Buggy wasn't originally on the game plan, but it ended up being that way. And we end this by saying that he's kind of happy staying in the shadow of Buggy. Mihawk does not want to be a pirate captain, all right? He does not want to be a Yonko. If he wanted that for himself, he could have achieved it. If Mihawk, let me ask you a serious question. If Mihawk woke up one day and he's like, I want to be an emperor of the sea, could he have not gathered together a crew? He's the greatest swordsman in the world. He could have put out a call for all of the swordsmen to join him. He would have gotten a bunch of people. All right, even if people just wanted to fight him just to claim the title, he would have gotten a bunch of people joining him. He could have built up a pirate fleet. He could have taken over some islands. Mihawk has the strength and the charisma to make that happen. Absolutely. That's not the life he wanted, right? And so now getting into his 40s and he's just kind of like done. He's like, all right, I'll join up with Crocodile. Why not? And then Buggy's there, and Crocodile's just like, you know, all right, well, this this guy is our captain, but we can't be, you know, letting this guy run the show. And Meok's kind of in the background like, well, you know, maybe maybe let him. He gets to deal with all the bullshit, and we're just kind of here in the background. I'm, I'm kind of okay with that, right? So that's Meok. I think we're going to find out a lot more about him as we go. But getting some breadcrumbs right now of exactly what's up with the guy's backstory is pretty good. At least we have something to go on now. We have, like, a foundation. Because we really didn't have much up until now. Where did he get Yoru? Does he have any connection to maybe Rayleigh? Maybe Rayleigh used to be his, like, trainer or something, like his master back in the day or something like that. I don't know. But uh, now we know something. Now we know something about context to the Marine Hunter uh, epithet that he had, okay? That's something there. Uh, next up, we have some drawings. We have three drawings in a row. I'm actually just going to show you rapid fire. So the first one, this was something I saw a lot of fan art of. Uh, when it was revealed that Ivankov came this close to consuming the Ua Ua Nomi model Azure Dragon at God Valley, I saw a lot of different fan art of, like, what if Ivankov had the Seiryu fruit? And most of them were great and hilarious. But Oda officially drew... Ivankov with the Seiryu, with the Azure Dragon Fruit. And oh my god, it's every bit as terrifying as awesome as I thought. Is there a word for terrifying and awesome? Terror... Terrorsome. Ter Terrorsome. Yeah, we'll go with that, all right? Like, oh my god, it's just... Imagine this thing coming at you. Imagine if, if in some weird events it turns out, like, Kaido becomes a member of the Revolutionary Army, and Ivankov was the evil overlord of Wano, and they had to fight <laughs> this dragon. It'd be, like, completely different story. Uh, next up, somebody asked Oda to draw uh, Roger's sword. So Roger has his trusty sword named Ace, uh, which I guess is maybe also the name sake for ace uh, i like to think that there was somebody in roger's past like maybe his mentor or like his dad or his grandfather some kind of figure he looked up to who was named ace and so then roger named his sword after that person and then ace was named after the sword but also after the person like it's a it's it's not just the sword that ace was named after the sword's name also has an origin in uh, somebody that roger respected growing up but anyway this is 
ace anthropomorphized, the uh, same way as like uh, Oda has drawn Zoro's swords and Kaido's Kanabo Hasaikai before Yamato's Kanabo as well. Uh, this is the anth the 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 anthropomorphization of <laughs> of uh, Ace and Yup, yeah, that's that's about right. Mato grade Ace uh, Saijo Owazumono, by the way. One of the greatest swords in the world, right there. Absolutely. Okay. And then finally, this is my favorite, though. I mean, the Ivankov dragon was good, but this is just, this made me laugh out loud. Um, what if Garling, St. Garling Figarland, never cut his hair? Because he has the hair coming out like this, kind of like a mohawk that's like, uh, like, like swaying. Kind of like a pompadour and a mohawk together. And then in his old age, he has this beard, so his face looks like a crescent moon. But what if he never uh, trimmed his beard? It would eventually turn into this, kind of like the Oros, the Ouroboros of facial hair. Like, where does his hair end and his beard begin? I, I just, it's just, it's cyclical. It's the snake. It's the serpent forever eating its own tail. You know what I mean? It's, it's the Ouroboros. So this is, this is great. This is phenomenal. Also, imagine like how that would impair his vision. You just walk around with just a giant like like, barrier of hair in front of you the entire time. So this is what I love about Oda. Like, Garling is a very serious character. Like, he's super serial, ladies and gentlemen, right? Right? Like, he's not the kind of guy you joke around with uh, from what we've seen, especially not right now. Um, but Oda could still make that character, like, funny just because the hairstyle is ridiculous. Okay, so there it is. That's that's pretty nice. Um, next up, uh, okay, so remember that flashback we had with uh, sword members at Hachinosu where it was a flashback where they were in the training hall at Marine Ford and Garp was like giving them a lecture in the classroom about like all right if if you're a marine and you're on an island and there's an old man and a baby and the boat only can fit two people who do you rescue you know it's like that kind of idea and Kobe raises his hand and he's like well I'm a marine and I care about justice and defending the downtrodden so I would sacrifice myself to put the baby and the old man on the ship and send them on their way to safety if that was the only option. And then Garp takes, like, the marker and just throws it at Kobe's head. Like, no, you idiot! You leave the old man behind! This is, this is William 101! You know, he's just right there. There's a man named William, and he's the one that got it. By that logic alone, Garp and William would probably be good drinking buddies. But anyway, yeah, no. So he's like, no, you, you leave the old man behind because he's old. He's gonna die soon anyway. But the baby represents the future. And you're a Marine, okay? And you're the future of the Marines, so you you get on that ship with the baby and you go off to safety and you leave that withered old crone to die. <laughs> You know, like, that's how it works. And uh, there was there was a Marine that was, like, the normal teacher for that class. Like, like okay, class, today we have Vice Admiral Garp to teach us some things. Um, so what was the name of that Marine that kind of chastised Garp afterwards? Like, Garp, you cannot, you cannot teach shit like that. Every life is equal. Every life is valuable. And considering the fact the Marines work for the world government and considering the world government, you know, has slaves and allows slavery to exist in the world, you know, that's that's the dichotomy that just doesn't work, right? That's just, it's like, it's like every life is equal. Well, we know the world government has slaves, but ostensibly every life's supposed to be equal. So that Marine's name was Ototo Gisu, and it's a name of a bird. It's the lesser kaku, sure. And uh, in Japanese, it's the Hototo Gisu. So Hototo Gisu, Ototo Gisu is her name, okay? And she's actually been a member of Suru's crew, so Suru, way back in the flashback with Doflamingo and Law, we see her crew are all women, and she was there, Ototogisu, and we also see her later when she's a little older at Dressrosa, okay? Also, considering that Kujaku is Osuru's uh, granddaughter, I was thinking that, okay, well in that regard, Osuru's daughter would have to be somewhere in the Marines as well. I mean, I guess it could have been she could have had a son, but considering a big theme of Osuru's, like, uh, crew, or, like, they're all women, I would assume maybe she had a daughter, and that daughter is also a member of the Marines, and then she had a daughter who was Kujaku, okay? So maybe Ototo Gisu is Kujaku's mom. I mean, the age kind of lines up and everything like that, so it's it's very possible. Uh, or maybe maybe something happened, like in a situation with uh, Dragon left the Marines at one point to go be a revolutionary, and so that's the situation with, like, Garp, and then his son is a revolutionary, and his grandson is a pirate. But maybe in Osuru's case, 
all of her family, all of her immediate family, stayed Marines. So maybe Garp is a little bit, like, um, like upset by that, like a little jelly of just like, oh, yeah, whatever, Osuru, your children and grandchildren all stayed Marines. My son's a revolutionary, my grandson's a damn Yonko! <laughs> You know, all, all things considered, Garp is probably very upset about that every night. He has to deal with that. My son is the most wanted man in the entire world, and my grandson is a freaking emperor. I mean, that's kind of badass, but also, still, they could have been great marines. Uh, but anyway, yeah, that's, that's the character there. Also, by the way, I should bring that up. So... With the reveal of all of those uh, vice admirals in the last chapter, chapter 1107, we got Tosa, we got, um, uh, well, we had uh, Hound, and then we had Dalmatian, not Dalmatian, Doberman, Dalmatian's another one. A lot of Marines are named after dogs. Uh, we already knew Dalmatian and Doberman, but now in the last chapter, we got a bunch of them, okay? So it seemed to me like... Oda is naming a lot of the female marines after birds, and then the male marines after dogs. I just did, there wasn't enough to really connect the dots before, but that seems to be the general case. Akainu literally means red dog, okay? So like dogs of the government kind of thing, government dog, that might be a reference to. Um, now, not all women are named after birds, and not all men in the marines are named after dogs. Obviously, you had, like, even in the last chapter, you had guillotine, uh, and there was another one that was um, not Tosa, he is named after a dog um oh who was another one that oh red king red king was named after like a kaiju in ultraman or whatever like that okay so he's not named after a dog smokers obviously not named after a dog strawberry mamonga they're not named after dogs uh in the case with female marines we have gion who was that sbs character that oda eventually made into a canon character and then bluegrass bluegrass is actually named after a genre of music she's not named after a bird now doll is interesting because doll is there's a type of uh, wild dog in Southeast Asia called a dole, D-H-O-L-E. And so dole, doll, and people are kind of thinking, also doll wears a spiked collar, so people are thinking maybe doll is named after a dog, which would break the system, because it's like women are named, also Isuka, who is in the Ace Light novel, uh, Ace is like marine rival slash love interest, um, is named after a bird as well. So it's like, okay, Women are named after birds, a lot of men are named after dogs, but if Doll is a female marine that's named after a dog, maybe there's a story there, maybe there's a reason why, Hibari, Hibari and Tashigi also named after birds, uh, but maybe there's a, a reason why she was named, because she's like the lone exception if that is the case. Oda might not have, you know, named her for that reason, he might have just named her Doll because he thought it sounded cool, and then later on somebody's like, oh, did you know that um, there's actually a species of dog called a dole that's, you know, very similar, and like Oda might have been like, oh, I didn't know that, because that does happen every now and then where Oda will be like, somebody will send him a message like, did you know this was the connection, this was it, right, and Oda's like, oh, yeah, no, totally, I knew that, not really, but okay, that makes it work, right? So we got some other random questions here that are fun. Um, Kuma's ears. You know how Kuma has like, you know, he has regular ears, but he also has the bear ears up here. What were those things? You know, a lot of people were throwing out theories like, is he part mink or is it a headband? Is it just a hairstyle? Like, what are his ears? Like, what are those things, right? And uh, it turns out in typical Oda fashion, I love this. They're just, it's just bedhead. <laughs> it's just bedhead. It's just Kumo wakes up in the morning and his hair is bad. He just, he just doesn't comb his hair right. <laughs> I love that because... I, like, you just never know in One Piece, right? It might turn out that, like, oh, Kuma's actually part mink, and it's like, oh, okay. But no, it's it's just bedhead. It's not even a headband or anything. It's not even a fashion choice. He just doesn't know how to brush his hair properly, I guess. So there you go. That's that's the origin of that. Um, you guys know Kinderella, right? Kinderella is the name of uh, the uh, Miss Universe, who was the wife of Wapple and uh, the queen of Black Drum Kingdom. Evil Black Drum Kingdom. Ooh. Yeah, it literally has evil in the name. It's, it's great. So um, there was a big question of, what does Kinderella see in Wapple? Why did she marry Wapple? This one is pretty obvious, honestly, and it's uh, 
his money because he's rich. Wapple had his own little cover story where he was living in poverty pretty much and then using his munch munch fruit, his baku baku no me, ate a bunch of garbage, spat out a bunch of toys that uh, had a special alloy in them that's only possible because of his devil fruit ability. And that Wapple metal became, actually it's what the Frankie Shogun is made out of. And uh, it became big industry and then he opened a toy shop and the toy shop got huge and then he opened like Wapple Industries and he used the money from that to uh, start up his own nation again, the evil Black Drum Kingdom. And Miss Universe was just there to marry him, of course, because he's got money. Also, uh, in Japanese, keen means gold. So maybe it's a reference to like a uh, like gold digging, like the idea of a woman marrying a guy just because he's rich and that's like the only reason just for his money and that's it. I mean, come on. Why would you not want to marry Wapple? He is a sexy bachelor, ladies and gentlemen. Would you not want Wapple? Yeah, no, no, nobody would, okay? And um, it's actually funny because we saw Wapple leaving uh, Marie Joie getting the hell out of Dodge after he saw Eam, and then Vivi escapes with him, and then you know, Kinderella is like, oh no, you have a young mistress! Ah! You know, just like, whatever will I do? You know, uh, she'll have to find somebody that, um, you know, has more money, I guess. I, I don't know. She'll Don't worry. I think I think Kinderella will be fine. Don't worry about it. She'll be okay. Um, what's next? Ooh, this is a good one. Uh, this is something that I didn't even, I, I didn't even realize. Uh, I didn't even notice people, like, mentioning this or talking about this, so I must have been completely out to lunch on this one. The Giants that went to O'Hara after the Buster Call, like, six months after the Buster Call when Vegapunk was visiting, and you saw the Giants hoisting the books out of the lake and bringing them to Elbath, I assumed those were just like, like, random giants, like, they didn't have names, well, they obviously had names, but, like, they were nobody relevant, I thought there was just some random giants hoisting shit out of the water and bringing it back for Saul, that's what I assumed. Uh, no, that was actually Hyruden, Gerd, and, uh, Goldberg. Yeah, no kidding, yeah, those were actually the members of the new giant warrior pirates 22 years ago at Elba, not, uh, going from Elbaf to O'Hara to pick up all the books. Yeah, that was them. So, yeah, I didn't even know that was a thing. I didn't even know, like, people like, oh, is that, is that, was that Hyruden? I'm like, I, was it? I don't know. So, Hyruden, at that point, would have been 59 years old. Uh, Gerd, who was the uh, friend of Big Mom in the flashback, would have been 53 years old. And Goldberg would have been 41. So, he would have been the youngest. He and Rode, Rode is the navigator of the uh, new giant warrior pirates. Goldberg is the uh, the cook. And they were born at the same time. They were born 63 years ago during the flashback. It was actually mentioned uh, along with the birth of Loki that they were all born at the same time. Okay, so Loki is also 63 years, well, 63, uh, yeah, yeah, years old right now, yeah. Now, a thing with the Giants with their age that I usually do, because it's mentioned that Giants live about three times the natural lifespan of a human, I will typically take a Giant's age and divide it by three to get a general vibe of how old they are in, like, human terms. So, in the case with, like, Dory and Broggy, they're around 160 right now. If you divide that by three, you get, like, 50-something, like, 52, 53 years old, and that's, like, in their prime fighting, you know, uh, moment in their life. Their heyday, as it were. You know, this is, my, this is their fighting prime, okay? Um, you might wonder, like, is 50 considered your prime? Like, maybe not in our world, you know, 50 is your prime, probably, like, in your early 30s is your prime, but this is One Piece. I also, um, I, I was thinking that because Oda is gonna be turning 50 soon, I think he's 49, because Oda's birthday's on January 1st, I think he just turned 49 this year. Uh, happy birthday, Oda, by the way. Uh, but anyway, I, I find it, like, maybe the older Oda gets, he makes the prime age of One Piece that. So, like, when he was in his 40s, it's like, oh no, your 40s, that's when you're in the prime fighting shape of your life. But now Oda's almost 50, he's like, oh no, no, it's your 50s, it's your 50s when you're in your prime. You know, to keep himself going when he's like, writing the manga that that would be kind of funny to me so at any rate with that in mind uh Hyruden, if we're doing the divide by three thing Hyruden would have been 19 gerd would have been 17 and goldberg would have been 13 okay in in like human parallels so it would have been like you know if Hyruden was like 19 that, that's the age luffy is right now so like going out to see maybe there weren't a lot of other giants in the village that were willing to help saul because remember saul was not originally from um elbath he doesn't really have any connections to them other than the fact he's a giant, right? He didn't grow up on Elbaf. He felt that they were kind of like wild and violent. So 
he ends up in Elbaf after the events of O'Hara. He's heavily scarred. And maybe the ones that actually listen to him, like, it's like, you guys got to go back and you got to find those books. You got to make sure that those books, the, the knowledge that the scholars of O'Hara died for still live on somehow, I know. And maybe all the other giants that were more about, like, warfare and battle were, like, not willing to help him. And then maybe Hyruden, Gerd, and, and Goldberg, because they were, like, younger giants that maybe had not left the island yet, were like, you know what, old man, we'll help you out. And so Saul was like, thank you so much. And then they got a boat, and they went to O'Hara, and they picked up the books, and they brought them back. At least that's my head cannon for it. That's how I'm interpreting it anyway. Um, what are the hobbies of sword? I actually have to pull that one up. Okay, so we already know Drake's because it was mentioned with the Toby Ropo. His ho hobbies are reptiles and astrophysics. Drake's hobby is astrophysics. I like to think he's just sitting out there with his you know telescope, like watching the sky, like oh look at that constellation. You know there we go, right? Oh wait, is it astro? I just I was, tr I was trying to think, why astrophysics? Like, why does that connect back to Drake and astrophysics? And I was thinking, like, is it because a meteor killed the dinosaurs? <laughs> is, is that what Drake is like? I heard. I heard dinosaurs were wiped out by a meteor. I'm going to make damn sure this doesn't happen again. Any meteors up there? Uh, I'm watching you. <laughs> That's like a dinosaur's biggest fear is the meteor coming back. <laughs> right? Anyway, uh, Kujaku's hobbies include taming others. It doesn't have to be sexy, but it can be if you so desire. Uh, and making sweets. So she likes baking. She likes making cookies. You know, it's like, she, wait, wait, wait. She's a baker. She makes baking and finally happened. Somebody's a baker in One Piece. And it's freaking Kujaku. I, the one character I don't think existed yet, so I couldn't have ranked her in the, the three bakery streams that I did. Because she, I don't think, was in the series yet. Oh my god, she actually, she shows up in Beiji's cover story, but we never actually, like, got her name there. It didn't, Prince Cruz does as well, in the Golems, but we just don't see their names until later. So yeah, she runs a, um, a BDSM leather dominatrix type bakery. I, I'd buy her cookies for a dollar. <laughs> okay, moving on. Prince Cruz's hobbies are camping, solo camping specifically, so he's just like... I'm going out in the woods. I have I have my leave on the Marines. I have my leave. I'm taking my two weeks, and I'm going camping. And you wonder if, like, Kobe is like, oh, can I come? No. Just by myself. And so he goes out in the woods, miles from anywhere, and he camps, and he reflects, and he thinks. And then he takes off his shirt, and he dances the night away in the forest because his other hobby is dancing. So that means he goes all the way out in the woods. And he's just like, finally alone. Cues up his little Den Den Mushi. You know, I'm a maniac, maniac. And he's like dancing through the forest. <laughs> it's like, okay. You know, once again, I don't know if those two things were meant to be together, but they are now. Same thing with Kujaku and her BDSM bakery. That That's happening now. That's canon, okay? Uh, Kobe is fishing and training. Kobe's kind of basic, honestly. I mean, like, I got nothing against Kobe. He's cool. He's fine. But Kobe's kind of basic. You know, Kobe's the guy that would go and order the pumpkin spice latte at Starbucks, you know. He gets normal Captain Crunch at the store. Y you know what I mean? He just... He's just Kobe, all right? He's just a guy, okay? But he's he's training. He's doing his best. He's fishing. Uh, that's why he ended up on Alveda's ship to begin with. He was out fishing and got on the wrong boat. So, yeah, that's Kobe. Uh, Hibari's, uh, is photography and pouch collecting. Uh, I don't know if that was pouch or, like, maybe, like, patches or something like that. She collects a lot of stuff because, you know, we have her, we have the bear named Kobe Senpai that's on her backpack, and she has a bunch of other, like, girly stuff on her backpack and everything. So she just collects that kind of stuff. Um, she collects, uh, uh, Care Bears or possibly Beanie Babies, I don't know. And then photography. So she takes her little visual, her photography den den mushi and goes out there into nature and takes pictures of things. That's, that's very Hibari. And then finally, we have Helmeppo, and his hobbies include fashion, which you got to give it to Helmeppo, because even way back when he was just at Shellstown and he was a piece of shit, and he was like Morgan's son, and he was just there, you know, acting like a douche to everybody around him, he did kind of dress, like, he had like a 70s, like, butterfly collar thing going on or whatever, he had the gold chain, um, but, you know, you see his outfits, he does dress impeccably, he's probably, like, 
Helmeppo, like, really did not want to be a Marine, like, an actual Marine for a while. He hated it, all the manual labor and everything, because he was growing up, like, basically a rich kid. But I bet after a while, Helmeppo was, after several weeks and months of just, like, he's not getting out of this, this is what, he, he's going to be a Marine and he's going to like it kind of thing. Helmeppo was probably like, you know what? Okay, if I'm going to be a Marine, if I can't get out of it, I might as well do it right. And so if I'm going to dress like a Marine, I'm going to be you know, impeccable, you know, I'm going to be a very professional Marine, right? So he does have the nice little hats and the, the visor and everything. It, it works. Okay. Yeah. And his other hobby is walking and eating. So just walking tacos. Do you ever have a walking taco? You just have the Doritos bag and you're just like, this is pretty good. You know, there you go. Uh, let's see. We only got a couple left here. Uh, so, uh, oh, the name of the uh, cross guild ship. So the big ship that has Buggy's head on it. Uh, what's the name of that? And it's uh, actually the Big Top Blaster. That's the name of the cross guild's official flagship that Crocodile didn't care for that much. But, uh, you know, I'm sure Buggy likes it. It's just he didn't want them to build something like that. So he's like, guys, guys. Cool ass design, but I'm gonna get beat to shit by it. Oh, why? What are you doing to me, man? So uh, that's the Big Top Blaster. Remember, Buggy's original ship was called just the Big Top. So this is just the upgraded form of that. Uh, okay, this is a question about Hachinosu. This is like a world building question. I love stuff like this. So Hachinosu is the pirate paradise. It's the pirate island, right? So, how does that work in terms of, like, everybody's a pirate? You know, so, so does everybody steal from everybody else? Everybody plunders? You know, how does it work? Or we see a bunch of buildings, and so it's like, well, every the government and the Marines kind of classify everybody that lives on Hachinosu as a criminal, as a pirate, because it's the pirate island. It's full of lead island. But when it comes to the way the actual island operates... Um, there are former criminals that use the island as like a safe haven, so maybe they're not really out there being pirates anymore, but they still have active bounties, and it's not good. So they basically run the shops and the restaurants, like that kind of stuff exists on the island. And Oda does clarify, like they, they do have codes, you know, it's not 100% lawless. To the Marines and the world at large, it might be seen that way, like it's, it's a lawless land, but there has to be a little bit of something going on, because otherwise people would, like nothing would be done, like... How are they going to eat food if, if there's no restaurant or if the, everybody keeps robbing the restaurant? You know what I mean? So there are former criminals that live there as a safe haven from the government. They run their bakeries and their spaghetti restaurants and their bars and stuff like that and, and saloons and whatnot. Everything that you need to, like, live on an island, you know, all the necessities and everything. Um, you know, I'm sure there's people that do dry cleaning and stuff like that, you know, do laundry. Pirates aren't going to do their laundry, so somebody can open up. Up a business like that and they take berries and currency it's just that you have to have some kind of a stable government to you know keep it going right but that's that and then finally the last question that i will cover here and this is honestly a huge one okay oda you know how oda reveals the god's knights like in the 11th hour like by the way the god's knight exists all these this group of like the greatest warriors of the government that were never really mentioned up until now here we are. We already had the Warlords. We already had the Yonko. We already had the Supernovas. We already have the Revolutionaries. And now we're getting um, the God's Knights. Well, you know what? Oda has done it again. And now we have another group of really powerful characters in the One Piece world. We have the Yon Cooks. The four greatest chefs in all of the world that work exclusively for the world government. And the Tenryubito, and the Gorosei, the ones that prepare all of their meals. And this is one of them right here. This is Winter Cuisine. Cuisine? Winter Cuisine. Yeah, Cuisine. That's how you pronounce it, right? Cuisine. That sounds weird, saying it that way. That's the way that's, you say that word, right? Yeah, it is. Okay. Winter Cuisine Komakov. One of the Yawn Cooks. Well, you know now that Oda's going to have to reveal the other three. Like, in the next SBS, it's going to be like, well, okay, who are the other three? This one is named Winter Cuisine, so obviously Spring, Summer, Fall would be the other ones, right? You know, it's so weird. I was going to bring this up in the review when, when, this, when this scene happened, and I was just like, this is so insignificant. Like, who gives a shit? I'm not even going to bring it up in the review. I should have, though. Remember the chapter when Saturn was heading, he wasn't at the island yet, but they were on the ships and they were heading to um, um, uh, Egghead. Or it might have been after they arrived at Egghead and they were starting the siege. Either way, 
you see Saturn enjoying a meal. You see him eating, like, some smoked sausage or whatever and just be like, oh, oh that's pretty good, you know, whatever. I did have a thought of, like, who prepared that food? He is a Gorose. He is one of the five rulers of the world, uh, under Eam, obviously. So it's like, d did the Marine chefs just, like, because nobody's supposed to know he's there except for the Vice Admirals and Kizaru. So I'm like, who made him that sausage? You know, and once again, I was at the time I was even like, that's too nitpicky even for me. <laughs> you know, that's too insignificant even for me. Who gives a shit who made Saturn sausage? Oda answered the question. There's the yawn cooks. There's four of them. And one of them came to Egghead. I hope he makes it out of this alive. But yeah, I mean, like, it makes logical sense if you're the rulers of the world are you going to just accept food from, like, some random Navy cook or some, you know, like, greasy spoon diner? Like, no, you're going to bring your top chef with you that knows how to cook the best food in the entire fucking world, okay? I'm actually kind of curious now. Like, this opens so many questions. I'm making a video on the yawn cooks. That's happening. Locked in. Sealed, okay? Um, Sanji versus the yawn cooks. Zeph versus the Yawn Cooks. These are questions. And I don't know if they need answers, but I'm gonna give them. You know what I mean? So here we go. The Yawn Cooks saga has begun, ladies and gentlemen. Just when you think you're out. You took out Kaido and Big Mom, but now you gotta face Komakov and the other three. <laughs> I love you, Oda. I love you, Oda. Okay. Well, anyway, yeah, that's the story of how Saturn got his sausage. Very, very important question there. Um, yeah, that was SBS, though, 108. Like I said, if you want to check out the whole post, I'll leave the Reddit link below. Once again, thanks to everybody that gathered information with this. Pew Peace, Inumaru08, The Will of Marco, and Artur over at the Library of O'Hara. Um, this will be teching, signing out. Happy birthday, all the leapers and leaplings that are out there. I heard that, that, that's, that's actually a term. I was at Bar Trivia the other night. We won. We came in first, by the way. I was at Bar Trivia the other night, and that was one of the questions for the, the, uh, the trivia was, like people that are born on leap day have specific names and it's it's leapers and leaplings i think was the was the term so yeah you learn something new every day anyway thanks for watching teching signing out and screen go